Hi, welcome to An Empowered Woman. I'm Desiree Dubois, the founder of An Empowered Woman and Us Girls Productions. And you have the pleasure of joining us today for our launch of Let's Talk Success. And my guest is Susan Fries, who is the owner of E. Cola Pest Control and Termite, Termite Pest Control. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> termite, pest yes. termite uh-huh. and pest management. Yes. So you manage yes. the pest. Yes, we do. Welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> They're giggling because I guess it's possible. It is possible to manage yes. the pest. Yes. Well, they always come back, which yes. is good for me. And are you talking about the two-legged or the four-legged one? All of them. <laughs> They're six-legged and eight-legged. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. tell us a little about your business. Well, my business is all alternative treatment, non-chemical methods. And uh, we do a lot of different methods, like heat, oil, water, and non chemical methods and we do a lot of different methods like heat or electro gun, which is 90,000 volts of electricity. And uh, we can also do chemical uh, applications, but we prefer the non-chemical. And the reason that is, is I've been in the business 32 years, and it is a man's world, and uh, it's wonderful. I always laugh about it. I never have to wait for the bathroom because it's all men, <laughs> so it's really great. But um, I got involved with the business because of marriage, and I worked with my husband for 20 years. And then after that, I decided to buy a company that was ran by two men, and uh, it's now grown to be six offices, and we cover San Diego to San Luis Obispo. Wow. And the reason that I really felt it was important is because my son, who's now 31, uh, had asthma. He was a chronic asthmatic. And so um, I had to learn a lot about asthma and, and learning how to breathe. And during that time, I realized that part of the problem was our indoor air quality. and. Part of that is chemicals. And so I wanted to provide, I found a need and I filled it. I wanted to provide a uh, solution to getting rid of pests because they are pests and uh, do it a non chemical and a healthier way. Wow. Yeah. So we do. We do. Yeah. You do have an interesting background as far as you started as an entrepreneur when you were. Seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wait, tell us about your first venture. I really don't first know. First business opportunity. My, you're going to laugh at this, but <laughs> um, my first business opportunity was I'm a native Californian and I used to go to the beach, still do, love it. And I'd go to the beach and I would get sand crabs and I would get them in buckets with water and I'd take them home and put them in a big red wagon. And I would walk up and down the street and I would sell sand crabs to all my neighbors. So that was my first uh, episode of being in business and I learned a lot during that time. And then secondly, I, uh, I realized that there were a lot of poodles in my neighborhood. And so I found another need and I filled it. I went to the library and I learned how, to, how all the different grooming ways that you can groom a poodle. And I was the new poodle groomer and in my garage. And my parents bought me a, a, you know, one of those shavers. And it was really a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Was it the work itself or making that money as a young person? All of it. All of it. And I love animals, so it was really great. All of it was really fun. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you shared is that one, uh, one of your inspirations for leaving, you left the house early or you left early because of, you know, feeling that you needed to do something different. Share, us, share a little bit about that with us. Well, uh, I, yeah, I left my house and went to college. I went to Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. I know you guys are thinking, how did I go from fashion to bugs? <laughs> I'm still wondering how that happened. But, um, yeah, I graduated from FITM. Um, but when I was a child, my parents were not... A happy couple. I, I'm sure there's many people that could, you know, relate to that. Very dysfunctional family. My mother loved me dearly. My father, he just was a very angry man. He just wasn't a happy guy. And so uh, early on, uh, they got divorced, and I always felt like it was my fault. And so I, uh, the rest of my time being at home, I was trying to be better and uh, be more. And I, 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 people ask me now, what's your drive? And I'm like, I still don't know what drives me. <laughs> I, I really don't know what drives me. I just keep going. Um, I always say I'll sleep when I'm dead. But, um, yeah, so I left the house thinking that, you know, there's got to be more than what I was experiencing there. And, and I just would pray and say, God, why am I here? What is my purpose on this world? It's got to be more than, than what I'm doing. I, I raised my little sister. Uh, I love her dearly. And... Uh, you know, I used to clean the house and watch my sister and do the things around there and doing all I could to be all I could be. And uh, I just felt like there was more outside my home. And so I decided to 
um, put in an application for the FITM and I moved out of the house at 17 and from that day forward I was on my own. And uh, I, I wouldn't go back and I, I don't regret anything that's ever happened to me because I feel like everything that happens in our lives and yours is an experience and we learn so much from our experiences that it makes us who we are today. And there's a lot that's happened in my life and I'm sure that you, everyone has their own story. Mm -hmm. But I just, I feel grateful, even um, in the really down times, I feel very grateful to have those because I feel like it just helped me realize who I was and what I can do. You know, and it's interesting because, because we refer to them as challenges. Yes. Yeah, many times in challenges, it's a way of, nicer way of saying, like, you know, the other words, in lieu of other words, let's put it that way. And um, when you're in that challenge, when you're in that storm, you know, it's, it takes a craft, a, a, a character, to be able to see beyond that and to be able to see above that and even to see inside yourself and realize that it's not you, it's the situation around you. Mm -hmm. You know, things that are happening, things are falling apart, whatever, just not to attach yourself to that and say, you know, yes, this is happening, yes, I happen to be in this mix, but it's not, don't let it define you, don't let it define your life dreams, your lifestyle, your life goals and ambitions because that's when the turning point comes. That's Anyone right. that's in business, you know, we've all had those moments where we're uh, only an inch away. You know, they're only an inch away from being in and being out of business. Mm -hmm. And you're having to make that decision of saying, okay, how can I look at this and keep going forward? So you've had a few challenges. Share a few of them that, with us that you can recall that tested you in that way. <laughs> There's been so many. There's been so many. And I heard a, a lady before me, you know, say that, you know, it's really heartbreaking when you know, a bump happens in the road and you have to make decisions that are so tough because you know your decisions are affecting so many. When you have employees, it's just so important because your decisions are affecting not only your employees, but their families and your customers. And so, you know, you don't take that lightly and, you know, working 16-hour days is a normal day. Uh, my biggest bump and my most recent uh, overcome event that I've had that I'm really... Um, thankful it happened and people will say, boy, that's crazy, is um, I had a horse and I decided to get on that horse one day and have a radio show, another story, but um, I was getting ready to get on this horse. I got on the horse and the horse bucked me. When he was bucking me a year before that, rewind, a year before that he had bucked me, same horse, and I had fractured my back. Well, that was very scary, but it took me six months to eight months to I get healed from that, and I decided to get back on. Yes, the same horse. Nice. <laughs> I know. And uh, But I got back on because I get back up again, right? And I got back up on that horse, and he started bucking me again. I said, no, not this time. So I started to dismount, and in my dismount, I shattered my leg, my right leg, right here. Um, and I didn't realize I did that. I felt like I just dislocated my knee, but I shattered my leg, and... Um, I'm a professional competitive dancer, so not only is it important for me to walk, but it's more importantly that I can dance. So uh, I'm laying in the hospital bed, and I told the lady, hurry up, fix me, because I have a radio show to do in uh, like two hours. <laughs> and she's going, darling, you're not going anywhere. And I said, you don't understand. And she goes, no, you don't understand. <laughs> and I said, well, just fix it. Just put it back and let, let me go. i got to go. And uh, she goes, you're not going anywhere. And I'm like, well, okay. I had no idea the damage I had done, and uh, the next day I met with a surgeon, and the surgeon said, um, darling, <laughs> and I said, no, you don't understand. Uh, you know, I know I'm 50-something years old, but I have a lot of years left. You don't understand. I water ski, snow ski, competitively. You know, you got to understand. Um, and he says, well, we'll do the best we can. I said, well, let me ask you this. Are you, are you the best? Because I only want the best working on my leg. And he says, you're a high achiever. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right, I'm a high achiever. And he goes, I, I go, what was your first clue? But anyway, so uh, six hours later and two surgeons later on Father's Day, on a Sunday, um, I came out of there. And it was the most amazing situation for me. Because when you work 16-hour days and you've got a schedule and you're keeping your schedule, and yes, I have balance and I like to play, but, um, you know, you have this ooh, drive uh, to be laid up on a couch 
And you can't go to the bathroom by yourself. You can't shower by yourself. You can't get a cup of coffee. Um, it is just incredible. And, uh, you know, I had to ask for help. I had to ask for help. And I got lots of help, which was really amazing. And I'm so thankful for that. But for six months, I was in a wheelchair. I didn't know if I was going to be able to walk again. I had to learn how to walk all over again. And now today, I'm in high heels, which is amazing. <laughs> and and I, I was in a competition this weekend. So I'm back on the dance floor. So it is amazing, and it's a miracle. And people would say, so how are you doing? How are you doing? And in my mind, I had to keep saying to myself, because spiritually I was uh, in turmoil, emotionally I was in turmoil, and of course physically I was definitely not to 100%. But people would say, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm getting better every day. I'm getting better every day. And my mouth and my, hear, my head had to hear me say that. It wasn't for their benefit. It was for mine. I'm getting better every day. And as we go through trials and tribulations, we have to say to ourselves, we're getting better every day. And you know, our lives are like a railroad tracks, and you've got good things and bad things happening all at the same time. It's not all high, it's not all lows. It's parallel. You, we're living a parallel life. And it's what we do in our heads and in our hearts that makes the difference. And we just have to make a decision today that we're going to be better today than we were tomorrow and strive for that excellence every day. And that's what I do, and it keeps me going every day. Wow. <laughs> that's a very humbling experience, but it sounds like you came out so much stronger. I'm yeah. going to compete at the U.S. Open, and it's the biggest event. And the song I chose to, to dance to is by Toby Mack. It's a Christian band, and it's called Get Back Up Again. And I just feel like that's so right up my alley is get back up again. I'm not going to get back up on the horse, but I am going to get back up again. What happened to that horse? Oh, do you really want to know? <laughs> this horse, I found out, was worth about $35,000, and I sold it for $0.35. Cents. And I, you know, I just wanted the horse gone because I had a barn in my backyard, and every day I sat on my couch with my leg propped up with ice, and I had to have rat poison for two weeks to make sure I didn't have a stroke, which I thought was ironic, that I was getting rat poison being a pest control person. <laughs> I'm like, really? Are you serious? Wow. It was crazy. But yeah, I had to take rat poison. I'm just like, that's crazy to me. Yeah. But it kept me from having a stroke, so I guess that's a good thing. But yeah, I heard him whinnying every day, and I never wanted to see that horse again. So that's what happened to the horse. He's in good hands, I'm sure, but just not mine. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that was something you tell me. You have victories. I mean, you've had great victories. You have um, one of the shared things that you shared, which I find amazing with your team. You've had a young lady since the age of 15 that's, you know, you've started yeah. a good company. And just, that's one of your victories, but you can share that and some other ones with us. Yeah, Melissa. She's, we call her my adopted daughter. She, her and her mother came to work for me, <clears throat> excuse me, almost at the same time. And uh, she was 15 and a half, so I had to get her work permit. And I told her she could only work for me as long as she got good grades. And so I, part of our agreement, employment agreement, was that she had to have her teacher call me on a monthly basis to make sure that she was getting the grades she needed in order to work. I didn't want her working for me and have her grades slip. So um, having those two, the mother and the daughter, they've had a lot of dysfunction in the home. And having them there and watch their progress and their growth both together, they call me and I'm kind of like their... Uh, referees sometimes when they have mother-daughter issues. Anybody can relate to that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they'll call Sue in to come in. And, um, in fact, I, I made it to where if they had any issues and they needed to just have a breath, if they just needed to take a breath to just, because you can get so in heightened in your emotions when things are getting crazy. And I said, just take a minute and pick a word, any word that's going to tell you both to just stop. Just stop wherever you are to take a breath. And uh, they chose my name. Go figure. <laughs> and so it's just a reminder that when they get heated, they need to just take a breath and just stop because they're not getting any progress the way they're going. So, so that's one of the victories. There's been so many. Uh, my son is 31 now, and he had asthma as a child. And I referred to that earlier as far as one of the reasons, main passions I have for uh, running the company I do. And uh, when I was on the couch and couldn't do all the things that I normally would do, it gave me time to do something that I've thought about doing for a long time, but never had the time to do. 
So, you know, be still and know, right? I mean, that came to mind. And I had to be still, which is like the worst thing in the world for me to be still. I just don't know how to be still. And uh, I've had people refer to me as making coffee nervous. So, so being still is not in my vocabulary. And, uh, you know, I try to fit everything in like today, you know, going from Arizona to here and all the things that happened just to get here today. But my son, Asthma, uh, while I was still, I uh, wrote a book, and the book is called Learning to Breathe, and I've referred to breathing because I have to remind myself to do that. I don't know if you can relate to that, but I have to remind myself to just breathe sometimes. So it's Learning to Breathe, and it is uh, our journey of learning how to uh, handle or work with uh, asthma, what we can do, and when he was a child, 31 now, uh, information is so much more readily available now than it was when I was raising him, but um, I wanted to give hope, I wanted to give help when people are feeling helpless and hopeless, not only with asthma. I have a radio show, too. It's uh, Pursuit of Passion, Purpose, and Connection. And it's syndicated, and it goes all over now with the Internet. And, uh, yeah, so all of those things combined, it's, it's been a wonderful journey, and I've only gotten started. I'm just getting started. I'm just in the <laughs> gate right now. You're making me nervous. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. So what about Susan? One thought from this Susan. Just wow, nice. from my heart. Yeah. Um, what comes to my really fast, without any thought on this, is uh, seek to understand more than to be understood. I just think that's huge. You. you know, listen, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So share a couple secrets to success for those of us who really want to pick ourselves up and keep going. Um, I think ourselves, we are, the, we are the ones that hold us back, that you need to dream big and think big, and uh, nothing is impossible. You know, it's just um, one thing that I'm teaching, I've taught my children and I'm teaching my employees now, ask and you shall receive. And I think that a lot of the times we just don't ask. And if we just ask, you'd be amazed, the doors that open. And with me is, I, I think about something and I think, that's way too big for me. That's just way too big for me. But the minute the thought goes in my mind and I start planning it just a little bit, doors start to open. It's the most amazing thing for me. But, you know, you just plan and plan big. Think big. Don't think small. Think big. It's amazing. And find a need and fill it. Find a need and fill it. Use what you have. You know, you were given gifts. You were created for a purpose. Fulfill those by using your gifts. <laughs> so one last empowering thought. You said so many, oh my so many gems. I know there's so many gems. That I, know I guess well. bloom where you're planted. You know, I never thought in a million years that I would go from fashion to bugs, but I bloomed where I was planted. And uh, being in business is a wonderful thing and the most horrific thing. There's goods and bads, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade any part of my life. I wouldn't. And we all have our lives, and uh, do the best with what you've been given. Yeah, that's Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for joining us. I hope you're enjoying these series of Let's Talk Success. It's just awesome for us to be able to have this up close and personal, candid conversation with these ladies who, you know, have accomplished things that some of us think they're not able to accomplish, but some of us are in desiring to accomplish. So I want to thank you for joining us today. And um, feel free to contact us at anempoweredwoman.com. I hope you subscribe to us on YouTube. I hope you join our social media. And I hope to hear from you soon. And until then, stay empowered. In today's publishing universe, where literally hundreds of thousands of books on history, travel, sports, ecology, yoga and fitness, relationships, cooking, every imaginable topic in fiction and nonfiction burst onto the market each year. How do you compete? Ellen Reed knows, and she's sharing many of her most valuable book shepherd secrets. There are plenty of how-to books that take you through the process of writing, laying out, and printing a book. However, Ellen Reed's Putting Your Best Book Forward opens up a whole new world to authors. As her clients have discovered with their books as seen here, Ellen describes what you need, and more to the point, who you need to make sure you have a book that looks, feels, and reads like those produced by the mainstream publishers and can stand tall next to them.
The publishing industry is increasingly taking notice of self-publishers and taking them seriously. There has never been a better time to get your book into the marketplace. Now you can know what Ellen Reed knows about producing books. And one of the biggest secrets she reveals is right on the cover, that you must put your best book forward.